Today we have the special guest Jay Urban. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Wait, wait. I'm showing to the people your trolley. Excellent. And in the meantime, we are already like 300 people. It's beautiful. Let's wait someone that is enjoying the live. You can drop guys the question using the sticker, the first one button below, so I can highlight your question. Few seconds yet and we are going starting. Before the door. So, hello to everyone. Hi, Jay. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah. Well, also my side. Perfect. I'm so happy to have you today with us. So happy and honored. Thanks for thanks Fine. for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, finally. So for those that I don't think there's someone that don't know you, honestly, but just to introduce, Jay is well known as a cinematographer, independent director, producer, and uh, his last uh, work is this feature film, Before the Dawn. And, uh, and yeah, uh, let's start with some question we collected yesterday from the from the box button and uh, the first one question how did you start in hollywood and uh, some suggestion also for people that want to start a career and want to move there in the hollywood industry okay well um i grew up in phoenix arizona and um when I was five years old, I saw the movie Star Wars in the theater and that um, I walked out of the theater and told my parents that I wanted to direct movies. And uh, of course, my parents at the time said, yeah, sure, kid, whatever. Um, and I've spent the rest of my life going towards that goal. So thanks for that, George Lucas. Um, after uh, doing a lot of theater and some television and some um, commercial work in Arizona, I made the move to uh, Los Angeles, California. And at the time that I made the move, I was working primarily in theater as a uh, master electrician and a lighting designer. So I thought it was mostly natural to start in the electrical department in film. And luckily through, at the time, America Online, um, the very day that I moved to LA, I had a job as an electrician uh, on a short film and very quickly learned that I knew nothing about the film industry. And all of my vocabulary was uh, theater and they were asking for stingers and I didn't know what that was. And it was, it was trial by fire very quick. Um, but I spent uh, my first few years working as an electrician in uh, movies and television and uh, some commercials and music videos. And then I moved my way up to being a gaffer. Um, and I did that relatively quickly, within a couple of years. And uh, Gaffer is uh, you know, head of the electricians, if people don't know what that is, uh, the chief lighting technician. Uh, and then I started to build a cinematography reel as I was working as a Gaffer. And I did that by producing projects, uh, mostly short films, but some independent features and some spec commercials and work like that. Uh, and then I became a director of photography for uh, about 10 years a little more than that, uh, and then transitioned my career from that into directing and producing, and that's mostly what I do now. I have a book here. Maybe you know this book. <laughs> you, you are also a writer. I, I know you like one of the most co important contributors also of the American cinematographer. So let's talk also about this uh, 
incredible passion you have to share knowledge every day. Yeah, yeah, you, you deserve this, uh, this shout out because uh, every day I found a lot of resources from your side. We shared a lot of posts of you and uh, someone are also part of this book, if I say right. It's right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I steal from that uh, whenever I can because I'm lazy. Um, and it's already written, so. Really, uh, you know, Alan Davio, um, a great cinematographer who shot E.T., Empire of the Sun, Color Purple, uh, Avalon, Bugsy. Um, he, he was an idol of mine, and I had a chance, very young, uh, to meet Alan at a trade show, and he was uh, ridiculously generous with his time with me. He basically spent the day with me. Um, and at the end of this wonderful day of meeting this incredible man and getting all this great advice that really steered a lot of my career. Uh, I said to him, Alan, I have no idea how I can ever repay you for this. And what he said to me then is you don't repay me when somebody comes to you and you are in a position to help in the future do so. And that's how you'll repay me. And I really took that very dearly to heart. And that kind of started me on this path to teaching and to sharing what I've learned as much as possible. Uh, and then through a fluke, uh, a friend of mine was, was writing for American Cinematographer Magazine. And I was doing some research on software uh, for cinematographers to kind of learn because I love computers and I love nerding out. And I had said, do you think the magazine would be interested in learning about all this software for DPs? And uh, sure enough, they were. So I wrote my first article for American Cinematographer in April of 1997. And they sucked me in and I just didn't stop writing for them. Uh, so it's been uh, 24 years now, um, almost, uh, writing for the magazine. Uh, and then that spawned off to writing for The Holiday Reporter and digital video and TV technology and a lot of other publications, um, which then spun off into getting invited to write my first book. And then the second book was a collection of all these stories. And so I, I've had this secondary career uh, as a technical journalist, even though I, I'm, I'm a terrible journalist, I'm awful at it. Um, I, I'm moderately good at being able to take something technical and reduce it into something simply simplistic. Uh, so that's become the secondary career of sharing and, and trying to teach. Yeah, there's someone that asked the name of the book is this. So you can screenshot, go to the Amazon and you can find there. I, I found there. So let's talking about Before the Dawn. Sure. How did you get involved in this feature film and how big was the production? Let's start from this. How I got involved is very weird. You know, um, I, I am the first to say that this is a business based on people that you know and connections that you have, and you never get a job off of a cold resume or a cold submission. And that's exactly what this one was. Uh, I was. I was actually in Arizona. I was visiting family, and I got an email from a networking group that just said, hey, we saw this posting for a director on this uh, uh, filmmaking website called Production Hub, and anybody interested? And on a fluke, I would never have responded to something like this. I just, I just shot in the dark. Why, why would you do that? But on a fluke, I was like, I feel like I should respond to this. So my whole family's gathered and everybody's having fun and talking. And I'm sitting in a corner on my phone realizing, oh, my God, I have to sign up to this website. And I have to upload a resume. And no, 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 just, just a few minutes. I'll be there. Don't just... And just weirdly, I, I applied to this position. And um, two days later, I got an email. Um, from Alana, and uh, she sent me the script. And on the same day, I got a submission from uh, an industry professional, 20 years in the business, uh, for a, a pilot TV script. And I read them both on the same day. And the pilot script was meh, not good. <laughs> It was not good. It really needed a lot of work. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I want to put this much work into this. And then I read Before the Dawn and I was blown away. I was like, this is, this is really good. So I, uh, I created a lookbook and I sent some notes back and, you know, kind of said, hey, I really like this script and this is what I think I would do with it. Um, 
And within a couple of days, we had a conversation and I wound up having a phone call with Diane Foster, who uh, was producing with Alana and uh, got hired on to do this production. Um, it was a very small production, very small. Uh, this is sort of the epitome of the micro budget, which I've done a lot of low budget and I've done a lot of micro budget in my career. And this started um, about as micro as they come. Uh, it, it grew as we uh, put the production together, but um, the first phone call uh, was a little terrifying as to what their plan was and also how quickly it was going to happen. So they were shooting within a month. Okay, there's one question pinned if you wanna read. Uh, not, not properly a question, it's like... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it is very difficult. Every time you change a position and you move up a rung on the ladder, more or less you're starting from scratch. So when I went from you know, being an electrician to being a gaffer, pretty much starting the career over and you have to start rejecting those electrician jobs and then you're out of work for a little bit and then you start taking the gaffing jobs and it's the same thing as a DP. Uh, you know, hopefully you have enough to kind of sustain yourself a, a little bit. You take a couple of jobs in the meantime, but basically you start over from scratch. The biggest jump for me was from being a cinematographer to being a director. Uh, and that was a very, very painful and is still somewhat painful of a, of a transition. Um, mostly I don't help it because uh, I still say very deeply in the cinematography world. I still write about cinematography. I still attend a lot of cinematography things. I, I'm known online for being a DP. Uh, I became a member of the American Society of Cinematographers a couple of years ago. So I, I don't help because I still identify myself publicly as a DP. Um, but it, it was very difficult transition from being a DP to being a director. Uh, mostly it, it's about, how people see you and all of yeah. my history contacts most of them still see me as a cinematographer and it's very very tough to make that transition into directing but um, projects like this uh, certainly are, are helping me make that jump you started talking about uh, alana she was uh, the leading actress the co-writer co-producer with you how was and how is important the relationship with a teammate like this? And in general, how is important to manage a good relationship with the whole team, the whole film crew, and uh, the DP, for example? You, why you choose that DP? I, I remember you shared a lot of tests with her and uh, yeah. since I follow, but uh, let's talking about this. Okay, so there's, there's quite a few things to, to adjust or to, to get to in that particular line of questions. The first thing is um, the energy of the crew and the relationship of, of the crew to the director and to the producer is incredibly important to me. Uh, I work very, very hard to curate the people that I work with to have uh, an incredibly relaxed and tight-knit crew. That's really, really important to me. The energy on set is incredibly important to me. So I, I am really, really careful about who I bring in. And if there's you know, a bad seat or somebody who doesn't vibe with that crew, they're out very quickly and I try to find somebody else. You're spending a lot of time with people and you're all joining together to create something. So making sure that everybody meshes well is really, really important to me. So that, that's one side of, of, of that. Um, with Olana, I realized really early on that she wrote this, she was producing this, and she was starring in this. So she was very passionate and very close to this material. Um, and she was trusting me to take this baby that she created and, and make it something real. So I realized that it was really more my job to reach into her head and pull out what her vision was, more so than me imparting my own vision on this. So I not, a, not a simple part. <laughs> Dude, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, a, not a simple thing to do. Um, <laughs> but I kind of, in that respect, I treated it a little bit like a, a television directing job where I am hired onto a show to be a, a director for hire to create the writer's vision. It's not normally the way that feature films work. 
but that was kind of how I, I, I approached this particular project. And then, you know, try to, to take her idea, understand her idea, and then elevate it as much as I possibly could uh, to, you know, create what we did eventually create. So that was a, a very interesting, um, not experiment, but a, a very interesting approach for me to do that. Uh, and that relationship between Alana and I was very important. You know, that, that had to, I had to make sure that she trusted me um, to divorce herself as the writer and to trust me as the actor and to try to get out of her own head, which is tough because you wrote it, you're producing it and you're starring in it. So, and we're a tiny crew. So her mind is constantly on continuity and on script and on wardrobe and I'm trying to, to divorce her of all of that and say, stop thinking about that. Yeah. Just let's look at the performance. Um, I, I was extraordinarily fortunate that she is a, a, an amazingly, brilliantly talented actress. Um, and I, I really got lucky in that respect uh, because the whole film you know, hangs on her shoulders. Uh, and then the, the other part of that question you asked was uh, the cinematographer. Uh, so in this case, uh, the DP for this production was Katie Williams, uh, who is uh, a cinematographer I had met uh, really just a few months prior to starting this production um, and was really impressed with her, was, was impressed with, with her work. Uh, and then we did a music video together and really clicked uh, quickly and well. Uh, and I really loved what she brought to that. So when this project came to me, I needed somebody who uh, was coming up in their career, uh, who was willing to jump off the cliff with me and do a very small production um, and, and sort of go through the trenches with me on that. And she was, she was the perfect choice to do that. Okay. Let's go in the tech part of the choices for the movie, camera, lenses. <laughs> I know you are more excited <laughs> in this topic. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I tend to be a bit of a nerd, so I, I, I can talk to that for sure. Um, Camera-wise, we, we went with, with the camera that Katie owns, uh, which is the Airy Amira. Um, and it was my first, uh, actually the music video was my first real experience with the Amira, but um, on this show especially, I fell in love with it. It is, a, it's an amazing camera. Um, it is just really, really well designed, and unfortunately it was kind of poorly marketed uh, because they were marketing the camera to the uh, news world and sports world, and it really is, it, it's a beautiful filmmaking camera. Uh, the lens choices uh, that we went with were, uh, came from a very dear friend of mine, Chris Probst. Um, and, and of course, Chris and I are, are working on a book together. We've been working together. Yeah, I, I remember well, you talked also Canon lens, I remember well. Yeah, so these are our rehoused Canon FDs. Uh, they were rehoused by GL Optics. And they're, they're basically, for all intents and purposes, they're Canon K35s. The, that was the origin of the K35 was the FD still lenses. So we were shooting with a variation of the Canon K35s on this, which is the, the FDs. And, and I fell in love with those lenses. Uh, I was super excited to be able to get those and, and use them. And Katie absolutely fell in love with these lenses and the look of them. Um, and they added a, a great character and depth to this film that I'm really, really happy about. Okay. About the light, what light you use? Why I want to show some uh, quick abstract, not the trailer, but some sheen we selected. We received some question about the post we shared yesterday about the light sheen, about the rain in the sheen, if it was a real fake. Someone asked about this. <laughs> it was fake rain. Well, it's real water, um, but, but it's fake rain. Uh, so again, with, with a very um, you know, small production, uh, we were all wearing a lot of different hats and I, I sort of became the special effects department um, and we picked up a number of uh, Hudson sprayers, which are like garden sprayers. They're, they're pump pressure 
Uh, and then you, you know, you water your plants or you, you insecticide your plants or whatever you're doing with these little sprayers. We picked up a number of these. And for the car scenes, we uh, ratchet strap them to the uh, roof of the car. And then just using uh, grip clips, uh, positioned the nozzles so that they would spray out. And while we were driving, spray out far enough so the rain would come back on the windshield. Um, that, that, that was a little tough to pull off, but it kind of worked. And you pump them up and then you spray and then you drive and they, they wind up spraying for a little while. And that's how we created the rain while we were driving. And we did the same thing for the cliff scene, the romantic scene where uh, they kind of first start to get together. Uh, and that was, you know, a couple of Hudson sprayers into sea stands, uh, shooting, you know, very cold water on a, on a cold night into the air. The, the actors were miserable, um, trying with, with tiny little battery operated lights at that time to, to backlight the rain so that we can see it and struggling to, to just perfectly get enough light within the frame so that we can see all the rain. Um, it, it was definitely a, a challenge for Katie and I to uh, to pull off those rain sequences, but I'm really, really happy with the way they came out. The texture is, is beautiful, especially the car stuff. It's actually some visually uh, some of my favorite stuff in the film. So let's talk about the time. Where did you shoot and how long was the shoot? Location? Uh... We shot in and around uh, Los Angeles, um, which is not an easy thing to do for a micro-budget film. Um, you would think that being the filmmaking capital uh, kind of of the world that it would be easier to make movies here, but um, it's not very friendly. <laughs> it's expensive. So uh, we, uh, we managed to work in and around uh, Los Angeles. The original production was 15 days uh, starting in late August of 2017. Through um, some reshoots and pickups, we wound up going a total of 20 days. Um, and yeah, that, that was... That was our production all around LA. Okay. I'm also scrubbing some questions. Ah, it's so tough to do. They just fly by. Yeah, I, I pinned one. And in the meantime, I'm scrapping other question. Do you read the question? So yeah. I'm able... How do you approach when you get a script as you worked as a gaffer, DP, director, you have strong visuals. And how do you manage between giving them importance to each field. Hmm. There's a lot to unpack in that question too. <laughs> um, how do I approach a script? The, the biggest thing about a script is that it has to be something that I want to see. That's generally the criteria of me knowing I want to make this project. If I'm reading this and, and feeling, oh my God, I want to see this movie, then that's generally something that I'm interested in, in jumping off on. Um, I, I've done a lot of things in my career. As a matter of fact, I, in the 30 some odd years that I've been a professional in this business, I have literally professionally done every job in production and post with the exception of stunts, hair and makeup, catering, and music composition. So one of the careers that I had prior um, was I was an actor. And I often approach a script still from an acting mentality. And that is to get to the spine of the story. What is this story really about? And then approaching each scene as who is the primary character in this scene? Whose point of view is this narratively from? What are their objectives? And what are the beats and measures that they try to get to in this scene? And that informs a lot of choices about what to do visually, what to do with the camera, where the camera goes, what I'm showing. Uh, and also even going back into, you know, lighting and, you know, technically other approaches to that. All of that goes back to the heart of the story and what we're trying to tell for that moment. Um, and point of view can change. I like stories where you have one point of view, where you're really with a character and you're discovering things with them as it goes. But I'm also, you know, I'm not opposed to stories where you have a larger point of view, but I really kind of gravitate more towards that. I like the audience discovering as the character does. And that informs a lot of the decisions that are made on the set uh, so that we as an audience learn information as the characters does and we get to explore the story with them. Uh, and in, in most respects, there, there's 
two points of view in Before the Dawn. There's uh, Alana who plays Lila and there's Jared who plays Jason. And we're following their two points of view as they come together in this particular story. There's someone that is loving the live. Kevin Garrison said, the one and only Jay Olber. <laughs> What's up, Kevin? It's Kevin. my pleasure because watching the live. I pinned another one question. And many, many people ask us how to approach to the right producer. How can I find resources to finance my, my feature, my film, my short movie, et cetera, et cetera. Do you recommend, for example, shooting a trailer? You, I remember you suggested many times to shoot the, an advertising of Tomato and put a reel and go to someone to show what you are able to do. I remember this yeah. suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, About that feature, uh, what, uh, what's, uh, what are your recommend? Good old Frio Lido coming in here. Um, so, yes, I, do I recommend going out and shooting a trailer uh, to get funding? Um, it is not a bad idea. The, the sort of danger in, in doing that, uh, first of all, it, it takes money and it takes time and it takes resources to do that. But they're also, you can sometimes lock people into a certain vision of, of what you're doing if you're not careful with that. So you have to be really, really careful about the trailer that you're shooting. And also in a perfect world, you should be shooting that trailer with the cast that you're going to use. Um, a lot of people will put together a, a rip reel, which is a culmination of other movies and scenes from other movies that you build a trailer out of to generate the feel of the movie that you want to make, to give a visual sense of the movie you want to make and the mood and the tone. Um, and that can be really helpful really any way that you can get across your idea to the people who may be giving you money for so that they understand it can become passionate about it. That's what you want to do. And, and sometimes that can be just a, a, you know, a lookbook of, of still images. Sometimes that can be music. Sometimes it can be you know, building a trailer. Um, but yeah, any one of these things is a great tool to, to find uh, somebody who is to get somebody passionate about a project. How you go about finding money is a great question. If anybody has an answer to that, please let me know um, because I could be making a lot more projects. Actually, I, I'm terrible at finding money. Um, mostly I, I, I join with other producers who are great about you know, going out and, and finding funding. Uh, in this case, Alana found her own funding uh, for this project and I was not involved in that at all. Uh, and that was an angel investor, um, but a sole private investor in, in this particular project. Uh, but how you find those individuals, I'm still looking. I'm looking under the couch cushions and, and in the backyard and uh, everywhere I go. Uh, anybody has any advice, let me know. I pin the, a little bit different question for the cinematographer that want to approach to an agency. The, the similar thing I, I told you before. Yeah. This, this is always a, um, a, a difficult uh, question. So it's, it's yeah, a cinematographer from Germany about uh, how to approach an agency to represent them and do I have any tips on, on how to approach that. It, it's, it's very frustrating because for the most part, an agent will come to you when you are ready to have an agent. Um, the agent makes their living off of you working. And unless they are um, dedicated and interested in developing your career and building you up and getting you there, which takes a lot of work and which they're not really getting paid for, then generally you have to already be a working and, and established cinematographer. And then the agent comes to you and says, hey, I'd like to represent you. And then life gets a little bit easier there. But you already have to be sort of working and built up. That's the old catch-22 in this particular situation. There are some agencies that will do development and there are some agencies who will take um, establishing and, and up and coming cinematographers. And in that case, it really just becomes uh, trying to find somebody who is represented by that agent who you know, who can make a connection for you to say, hey, this is my buddy and you should take a look at their work. And that's the, one of the best ways to get into an agent is that personal connection. 
The next is, is kind of the cold way and just emailing the agents and, and most of their contacts are out there by their websites or whatnot. And just say, hey, I'm, I'm an upcoming cinematographer. I'm looking for representation. This is my website. Um, and if you'd like to talk. And it's going to take, uh, you know, 50 of those maybe to get somebody to respond and say, sure, yeah, come in. Let's meet. Let's talk. Uh, let's have coffee or something. Of course, not during quarantine. Um, but it, it's, it's a difficult and delicate situation. I will talk coffee. <laughs> I will talk coffee. It's, uh, it's time yeah. to change something. <laughs> You can, do, you can do a Skype coffee. <laughs> There's also another guy that asks, I'm a writer, how do I pitch my sitcom to director? There's a similar question to how to pitch in different uh, spaces. Yeah, dude, for, the, for the most part, it becomes relationships. It becomes uh, who yeah. you know. So you have to get to know directors who are doing sitcoms. Um, and I... Because I'm not in that world, especially the sitcom world, I'm not sure where those directors are. You know, I, I tell people, uh, cinematographers, in order to meet directors, you need to go to places where directors hang out. So as cinematographers, we tend to go to trade shows and we go to, um, you know, uh, equipment houses and we go to equipment demos. And these are really cool and great for cinematographers. They're terrible for meeting producers and directors. Because all you're meeting are other cinematographers who can't hire you. So as a DP, where you're going is to uh, film festivals, where directors are, especially the parties at the film festivals, uh, to uh, revival screenings of movies when Jaws is screening in a local theater. Get out to that because I guarantee you all the local directors are showing up to that because they're passionate about that. And after the movie, when you're talking to people and you're meeting people, that's where you get a chance to kind of communicate and meet. Um, where you meet sitcom directors? The internet? <laughs> I have no idea. Social media? Find them and, and uh, you know, start following them and stalking them and make comments on, the, on their posts. This is me making a comment. That, that's how I type. Um, I, I think also for the super young people, screenwriter and some actors can build relationship also through the social media and maybe starting a collaboration with specific content designed for the Instagram platform, for the TikTok platform. I know, for example, for the actors, TikTok works a lot. So a quick suggestion could be also to, to start experimenting in this way for the actors, especially because I'm reading a lot of actors are dropping questions in, uh, at the moment. I'm, drop, I'm pinning sometimes some questions, Jay. Yeah, I'm seeing them up here. Mm -hmm. So what are key points I need to focus on? Whoops. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> what are key points I need to focus on when directing a shoot, for example, close up of an intense fighting scene? Maybe we can talk also about your movie, how to manage the actor in the scene, how to plan a scene. You yeah. can also enlarge the question and talk about uh, how you work. Yeah. So it, especially on this film, um, because it was small, because the prep was so quick, it, w it was less than three weeks uh, of pre-production time. Um, I didn't do any, I deliberately didn't do any uh, specific plan like storyboarding or shot listing even. Um, I, I deliberately made a choice not to do any of that. And my choice was to go to the set every day. And sometimes it was a brand new location we had never seen before. We had never been able to scout so we're going in cold completely. And then what I do is I bring the actors in and I block the entire scene that we're going to shoot, figure it all out. Even if it's going to be, you know, stretch over a day or two, uh, block the entire scene. And then me and the cinematographer watch the scene while the actors are, are rehearsing. And I will walk around and I will move myself, you know, like a camera and be, okay, this is the shot for this moment. And, and, and this is the shot for this moment. And oh, oh, over here, he has to look at his watch. So, okay, we need an insert of, of a watch here. And then at this moment, he's gonna turn and look away. So we need the point of view of the shot over here. And then by the time we're done with blocking, I have my shot list. And I know, okay, these are my six shots going in here. And I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get this, and I'm gonna get this, this is. For Before the Dawn, that was an exercise in 
economy for me. It was how can I tell this scene the most simply that I possibly could because it was such a short production schedule. We had 15 days to shoot a feature film. I knew I couldn't get crazy elaborate and I couldn't do a hundred setups and I couldn't hose down every scene coverage wise. I had to approach it and know what are the absolute key moments that I need to tell this story. And that's how I went into to each moment. So Katie and I would watch the, the blocking and the rehearsal and figure out our shots and then just, you know, fire through them and, and move on. Um, when it comes to a fight scene or an action sequence, I don't have a lot of experience. So I am one to bring in a stunt coordinator and, and I'm, a, I'm a big fan of stunt coordinators. Pretty much for me, any time that an actor has to do anything starting from a fall, if they have to fall down, even if it's just a stumble, I want somebody there to make sure that they're doing it right and, and protect it. It doesn't mean that we need a stunt actor to do it. The actor can fall on their own, but I want to make sure that there's a professional there with the right padding and the right protection to cover that. And the stunt coordinator is an amazing resource to once they have blocked a sequence, for instance, we do have a fight in Before the Dawn. Mm -hmm. The stunt coordinator blocked that sequence. And then when they do, they're a great resource to say, hey, if you come over here, this hit's going to sell better uh, at this moment. So, okay, we're going to, I'm going to hinge from here and I'm going to work off of this moment. And then you start building it with the stunt coordinator and you really partner with that person to figure out the coverage of that particular scene. Um, and that's how we approach this. I, I let the stunt coordinator work with the actors, figure out the blocking, kind of supervise that, but pretty much let them do that. And then Katie and I figured out how to cover that moment and, and get the impacts um, and, and shoot that action element. Okay, hi Pinad, another one question. Can you tell us about the emotional preparation you undergo as an actor before an intense scene? I received also another one question about the psychological component in the in the sheen for an actor for the whole crew, like we talked at the beginning, the, the, the feeling on set and anything about the emotional side. It, it, going back to my days as an actor, which really feels like a lifetime ago, um, my particular method was to really put myself mentally in, in, into that character and believe what they were believing. Only know what they know, only know what they're trying to achieve in that moment and to just listen to the world around me and, and react to that. Um, I, I was never really like a, um, a sense memory actor. You know, I, I wasn't thinking about, you know, losing a pet when I had to cry. I was more in the moment of whatever that intense emotion was that that, act, that character should be feeling at that moment. Uh, that was my process. For, um, for Jared and Alana, I, I didn't really get, I didn't like try to pick apart their process. I let them do their thing. Um, and mostly for Jared, that was uh, moments quiet. He had to kind of go away a little bit. He listened to music constantly. Uh, and the music was informing the emotion of that particular scene. So when we had our, our most emotional moments, I, I knew that I had to build in a little bit of time for Jared to take a moment and, and listen to his music and get into that headspace. And then we just all had to be kind of ready. And I knew that moment I, I would be able to look at him. He'd pull his earphones out and great, here we go, let's roll. And it's my job as a director to protect that and to give him that space reasonably, because uh, we still got a schedule, still got to make a movie, uh, but to give him that space to get to that moment and also make sure that everybody was else was focused and ready so that when he got to that moment, we're rolling. And, and there isn't a lot of action and there isn't, oh wait, we got to get the microphone ready or, or oh, sorry, that light's got to be repositioned. No, we're, we're ready to go. Um, Alana was a lot more, uh, kind of turn it on, turn it off. And she did a little bit of music and she did a little bit of moments by herself, but for the most part, she was able to kind of shut it off and, and, and go into performance. So 
I also knew in that respect that I was mostly shooting her close-ups first and giving Jared a little bit more time to build into things. Uh, and that was, you know, you kind of come to understand the rhythm of actors and, and how you go about uh, treating them to make sure that you're protecting their process. And that was part of um, that particular aspect. It was a long-winded answer. Okay, there's a friend of the page. Do you think high-end episodic TV is going to take over from features with the budgets getting bigger and bigger? You can also... There's no doubt, uh, there, there's no doubt that, that television is a whole new world. Um, and the, the line between televisions and, and features are blurred really never more than this year. Uh, you know, the Academy, because of the whole quarantine and the COVID situation, um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences just announced that they will consider, uh, because there are no theatrical releases, uh, they will consider movies that uh, stream first for consideration uh, for the Oscar, which this is the first time ever that that will ever be done. Um, but those films have to have had a planned theatrical release. You know, there's, there's aspects of that. But television is a wonderful, wonderful playground for uh, creatives and for filmmakers. And part of that is that you're not honed into a two hour window or a three hour window, you have six hours, nine hours, 12 hours, 24 hours to tell a story and to really investigate characters. And I think that that is a beautifully rich, wonderful landscape to play in. Um, it, it's, I'm trying to, to get into that particular world because I want to work in that and I want to be able to tell stories in that way. I think that's really fascinating. When television moved away from single enclosed episodes into elongated storylines, it really, really opened up the wealth of what can be done there. Do I think that TV is going to replace feature films? No, I don't. I don't. I, I still think that there will be that two, two and a half hour, you know, 90 minute to two and a half hour window of feature films. Um, I still think that that is a, a way of, of telling stories that people for a hundred years have gotten used to and still want to see. It doesn't mean that they're, they have to be separate from each other. They can live in the same world. You can have your television shows, you can have short films, you can have feature films. Um, so no, I don't think it's going to take over, but certainly TV is growing and what Netflix, especially and HBO and Amazon and Showtime are, and even AMC, uh, are doing with television is, has changed the landscape. Um, I <laughs> embarrassingly grow, growing up as a kid, uh, I had a, a sign hanging on my bedroom door that said, um, theater is life, film is art, television is furniture. And I, I kind of felt that way growing up, you know, TV was there, eh, whatever. It's just kind of this thing you need to waste time, but that's changed. And, and really starting in the 1990s, that changed a lot. And now TV is an amazing, amazing place to tell stories. And there's some great, great work being done in TV, Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, Game of Thrones. Uh, it's, it, the list goes on and on of, of shows that are changing that landscape. There's a question about animation field. I, I don't know anything about animation. Um, I, I love the Pixar movies, um, but I, 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 am not, I am not well versed in that world at all. I've never worked in that world, so I, I, I wouldn't even know. Um, and kind of ancillary to that, the video game world. You know, the video game world is actually significantly larger than feature films or television. And there's some amazing storytelling and some amazing filmmaking work that's happening in video games um, that I need to pay more attention to. And I haven't because I tend to have an obsessive personality. So if I play a game, I wind up losing weeks of my life to that game. You know, where suddenly it's, oh, wow, it's Wednesday. Where did the week go? Ah, I'm sitting in my bathroom playing a video game. Um, so I kind of stay away from that world a little bit. But they're all amazing places to tell stories. What do you think about uh, CineTracer, the software of the big uh, uh, cinematography database? CineTracer software oh, to, oh, yeah, yeah. Matt to create a preview of the scene. I have only seen his demos of it. I, I have never played with it. I, I think that it's a wonderful tool. I think it's amazing. Uh, I think it's, a, it's amazing for not only planning and you know, pre-production, but it's also amazing for young 
cinematographers to learn. Yeah, um, yeah. Eating. It, it's an incredible tool for that to be able to play and work in this world and bring all the tools out. Um, I also was a, a very, I still am a very big fan of Frameforge, which is a 3D storyboarding program. Um, and that you, you build uh, little actors and you build sets and you move them around and you move the camera around. And I found that that's a, an incredible tool for discovering things that you wouldn't have thought of before. So as you're storyboarding, you're building and you're adding cameras and then suddenly you, you look at a camera that you forgot about and you're like, oh, wow. Oh, oh, that's, that's interesting. A but lot of mistakes to save it. <laughs> a lot of mistakes. <laughs> And unfortunately, especially the way I worked on, on Before the Dawn, being very, very quick and, and very limited in our coverage, there was no way to display and discover like that. Uh, you know, we didn't have a second camera that we could kind of explore with. Um, but having these tools to play with in pre-production, like Matt Workman's uh, program, is, is really yeah. cool. incredible. I have a little kid, no time every day, but I want to try this software. I was so, so hyped to try. There's one... There's one vintage guy, CDs, vinyl, etc., are all coming back to the mainstream. Do you feel like this may happen to cinema movie theaters? Something nostalgic, nostalgic later down the line. <laughs> there is an aspect to that. Um, there is an aspect to that in the resurgence of use of 35 millimeter motion picture film to shoot movies on. Um, you know, for a hundred years that was the primary medium for shooting films was film and then in 2001 uh, George Lucas brought the HD world into production and that really kind of changed the landscape and by uh, 2006 if I remember correctly we hit a point where there were more movies um, I'm sorry 2012 is where we hit the point where there were more movies originated digitally than there were originated on film. And then that kind of really took over there and it became about 80, 90% of movies were shot digitally. Now that's coming back a little bit. So there's this resurgence of 35 millimeter film as kind of a nostalgia, as this is a traditional way of making movies and a little different way of making movies and telling stories. So that's made a comeback. You got filmmakers like Steven Spielberg and Christopher Nolan, um, and Quentin Tarantino, who are insisting on continuing to shoot film, uh, and in some cases projecting film, although that's incredibly rare. Uh, so yeah, there's an aspect of that. The kind of relating back to the the vinyl concept there, you know, are we ever going to get back to DVDs or physical media being a, a big thing in movies? And I'm not sure. I, I think that's kind of gone the wayside. Um, you know, I. I I have a collection in the other room of about 400 uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, and I still kind of like to have that physical, but I also have about 400, you know, in my streaming um, uh, yeah, yeah. library. Um, and I also like the instantaneous of, oh, look, I'm going to watch Star Wars today. Boop. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have a crystal ball on that, but some nostalgia coming back. Yeah, yeah, the same. I have a collection of Scorsese, but only to, to see every day in my, in my <laughs> library. <laughs> I pinned another one question. Would you like to know if you would schedule the shot as linear as possible to story, or how would you do it? It's a breakup story. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's incredibly rare that you get to shoot a movie linearly. Uh, from scene one to scene 30 to scene 120. It, it just, logistically, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, time, money, locations, all of these things come into play. So what you wind up doing, um, primarily the schedule in, in micro and in low budget productions is generally dependent on the location. So for instance, uh, in Before the Dawn, uh, one of our primary locations was a high school. You know, it's about a high school teacher who um, falls in love with a student. So that school, physical location, was 30% of the movie. It was a third of, of our schedule. So we shot in that school for one week. But that means that during that week, we shot every scene that took place in that school. And even further to that, we shot every scene that took place in one classroom. 
And then every scene that took place in another classroom on another day. And then every scene that took place in a hallway on another day. And these are intermixed. But you do that logistically so that you are only lighting that classroom once, technically, and lighting the hallway once. Because that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. So you light the hallway and you bring in the actors for one scene and then other actors are waiting for another scene and you might shoot scene seven and then the next one might be scene 47, but it's the same location and that becomes the primary thing. The next thing is generally the actor's availability and their schedule and making sure that the actors don't have too many gaps in their schedule. So what you try not to do is have an actor shooting on day one and then on day 15. So you try to make sure that actors shooting on day one and day three and then they're done. So that's the other thing that you're working in, in, in trying to schedule. And there's a lot of other factors that come in, like we need a crane to shoot these three shots. Okay, we're gonna put all those three shots on the same day, so we're only renting that crane once. Um, most of that is dependent on logistics and money and the cost of the production. So I have, I have yeah, in, in, in my career, I'm trying to say if I've, if I've ever done a linear film Not really, no, no. Um, I had a couple that were kind of planned that way, but they didn't wind up going that way. So the logistics and the cost always supersede um, the, the creative, sort of. Don't quote me on that part. Okay. <laughs> we, we have a few minutes before to stop the first one hour. <laughs> we have a other question about favorite book. If you can stay in a couple of minutes, we can reply this one, this one sure. question. And next, we will start the, the other one live. Favorite book, directing books, cinematography books, we already showed one of the J. I can't pick my own book, but you can, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, directing book, my, my absolute favorite is Making Movies by Sidney Lumet. Um, it, it is a brilliant book. It, it is his thought process of how he approaches making movies uh, really informed a lot for me. Uh, and that's an incredible book. Making Movies, Sidney Lumet. I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, when it comes to cinematography, um, actually, there's a book called Cinematography by Chris Melkowitz and Dave Mullen that um, was one of my favorites coming up. Um, I do have, if I can remember the URL right, it's uh, jhoven.com slash reading hyphen list, I believe, uh, is a book, a, a list of books that I, that I recommend. Yeah, next, guys, you can ask us in Diane some title, some link. We can, uh, we can drop the link in the Diane message. So another couple of minutes. Can you tell us about your rehearsal methods with your actors? That's interesting. Um, I don't have any particular like structure or, or methodology uh, for how I would rehearse actors. Basically, I, I, I let them run the scene and I let them discover um, and play. And then it's my job to guide them. Uh, so I would, you know, put them in, in the general set and say, okay, I think we're going to start with you over here and we're going to start with you over here and uh, let's play the scene and then kind of see what they do. And the actor is going to have an instinct of, you know what, I need to get up on this line. I need, I, I need to stand here and be like, okay, I'm stand. Let, let's see what that looks like. Okay, if you stand, then, then we got to come around and do this. But I, I let them explore and it's my job to just kind of guide them. Be like, no, nope, no, you know what? You, you can't stand there. I know you want to stand there, but we got to hold off on that because what I want to do is I want to come and punctuate this moment here. So we're not going to stand there. We're going to stand on this moment. And I need you to figure out a way to internalize that. And then we'll, we'll, we'll work with that. But for the most part, I try to follow their instincts and then, uh, you know, guide and, and figure out how to explore and make that, that work. Um, actors, are, are amazing in that respect that they have that intuitive thing to try to make things real and truthful. That's really what I want to pull out of a scene is the truth of the scene. 
So, yeah, that's probably what I'm doing in rehearsal is trying to discover that. I, I have my kid. He's... <laughs> I heard that. Hi. There's a question. I think it's better to, to read the question and reply in a new one live. So we are sure to save this one, okay? What lens do you prefer? A block lens or zoom lens? We will see in a few minutes from now, okay? Okay. Okay.